The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Today we're coming back to um, Blockchain and Money, uh, uh, Act 3 of this course. Now that we've done a little of the basics, a little bit of the economics, and now it's some use cases through the lens of finance. And, and to say something about, uh, uh, one, why I thought it would be worthwhile to structure the course this way and what, what I'm hoping we all get out of uh, these uh, next 10 or 11 lectures is that I thought that it was important after laying some foundation of what blockchain technology might or might not be in cryptocurrencies and of course talking about the economics is to use one field that's the most dominant field right now about potential blockchain technology use which is finance. It's not the only area but finance is completely reliant on ledgers. It's completely reliant on moving property rights around multiple parties. And of course, it's the first use case was about Bitcoin, which was uh, you know, a peer-to-peer -peer money. So I thought, even if you're thinking about this in terms of healthcare, thinking about it in terms of the Internet of Things, et cetera, many, many other use cases, why not take Finance. Now, it also happens to be my comparative background, and I've spent the last three or four decades of my life around finance. And so I can be most helpful and dig deep, uh, uh, you know, probably as deep as you want to get in the mortgage market, the payment markets, the uh, uh, exchange markets. Um, I've probably been there at some point in my career or still have contacts and networks and have studied it. But no doubt, with the 80 of you in this room, or 90 or so, you're going to press me, and I like that. Um, I will say last weekend was really a joy right, reading 50-plus papers. Um, that uh, um, uh, There was only about 25 of you that decided to hand in papers early uh, in classes 2 through 9, but class 10 was 50-plus you know, of you, so I really do have a sense of the class in terms of uh, what do you think about finance and blockchain. Of course, you'll probably do the same. I think I might design it differently the next time, but if you all hand in, uh, if 50 or 60 of you hand in the papers for class 23, <laughs> uh, um, it, it will be, a, it, and you have that right. I'm not taking that away from any of you, but uh, um, it means I might be delayed getting back all the projects. Um, I want to say two or three other things uh, overall. Um, in terms of where we are, we're halfway through the semester, and Sabrina and Talita and I did a good job of just saying, how are we doing on class participation? And I've kidded a lot, and I've joked a lot about you know, who's talked and so forth. We're down to about 15 of you that have never talked in this whole 12. You know. So I want to work with you. I'm not trying to torture anybody, and I really want you all not to worry too much about your grades. I want you to worry a little bit, but not too much about your grades. But if you've not spoken yet and, and you haven't gone online, two people have gone online, both of whom I've responded to, <laughs> um, uh, you know, come see me. Try to figure out how to be part of this community and this discussion, whether it's in class or online in some way. Um, I, I just, because um, uh, again, I want this to be a positive learning experience for everybody. In terms of the papers, just some overall things. Um, by and large, they were good. Um, uh, some were extraordinarily good, I mean, so they, they, which you'd expect with such a talented group of people, but some really made me think and challenged me and so forth. Um, uh, it is a bell-shaped curve. Some, on the other hand, not many, uh, kind of missed the mark. So I just want to say a couple things. One is it's not about just answering the three study questions. The study questions are really to spur the dialogue here. Those three questions, uh, not many of you, but two or three people just sort of just tried to answer those. Think about it as a uniform three-page paper. Five is the limit. The one or two of you that did six or seven pages, that's fine, but it's just, 
you don't need to, and it just, it's more work in a sense for us. Uh, two is I really did try to give feedback and comments, and overall, what we're trying to get to is what are the economics here? What is there about append-only logs and consensus protocols amongst multiple parties writing to a shared ledger? So multiple parties, you know, updating some state of economic, an economic state really, of property rights or something. Um, and what verification costs, what networking costs can be lowered. Um, and uh, it's unfair because all, all of you are going to try to figure out a final project together. And, and I went back over the weekend looking at the final projects. Um, I think there's some really uh, neat ideas that you're all looking at. But at the core is what verification costs, what networking costs can you lower? Why do append-only logs, consensus amongst multiple parties sharing a ledger, and possibly a native token? Um, because you don't have to do something around permissionless native tokens, but I think some of you will get there and we'll have some exciting thoughts. Um, so that, those, were, those were my thoughts. If I say in the comments to your paper, and I only did this two or three times, come see me, don't be scared. It might just be I want to pursue. I said this on some really excellent papers, and I said this on a, one or two that just I thought, um, uh, it, it'd be worthwhile to talk about. Um, but uh, I'm trying to just get through this all with you and have you learn. Um, so those are some overall thoughts on where we are halfway through post-SIP week. Today we're going to talk about payments. Um, and and uh, Thursday, we have a guest, uh, 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 Aline. Uh, if you want to get mic'd up, I've got a mic up here somewhere if you, because I'm going to call on you, or you can speak from there. But uh, you'll, you'll I'll, I'll, I'll be loud. I'll be better. You'll be loud. Yeah, that's not hard, is it? Um, so what are we going to do? We're going to talk about uh, uh, just what are we trying to cover for the rest of the semester. Sort of call it H2 and blockchain and money. Uh, the readings, uh, payment systems, ledgers, and credit cards. Just a little bit of history all together. Uh, and that's when you're going to meet uh, uh, Aline, uh, not computer science Aline, but payment Aline. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, mobile payments, which is a very significant change uh, all the way around the globe in payments. Um, then uh, global and US payments statistics, uh, Bitcoin and, and blockchain, we're going to come back to, and then conclusion. And remember, whether it's this week, next week, or the following week, this is all just to sort of say, well, wait, what are these use cases tell us about blockchain? What do these use cases tell us about cryptocurrencies? Um, my goal isn't that everybody here is an expert in payment, but if your final project is around the payment space, or if you ultimately want to go along and become an entrepreneur and do something successful in this space, hopefully these two lectures today and Thursday will help. Um, and I can't remember exactly uh, what next week is. Next week's central bank and commercial banking. So next week we're going to turn to central bank digital currency and what is, what's going on in Sweden and why the e-krona project's interesting, but how's Canada looking at it through their Jasper project? What's China kind of thinking about and why they're a little worried about this space? And yes, what's the private sector doing around stable value tokens? So you have this sort of a similar thing coming both from central banks and from from the private sector. Uh, I just came from a meeting where uh, one of Larry's colleagues, he's from the Harvard Business School, a professor at Harvard Business School came over to, because he's got a stable value token project. Um, and and uh, um, so that's kind of next week. We're then going to go and talk about uh, ICOs. You couldn't do a course in blockchain and money if we didn't talk about initial coin offerings. Of course, 25 or $30 billion has been raised. Um, it's, it's an enormous crowdfunding opportunity for any of you that want to be venture and entrepreneurial uh, after this course, but it's an important also test. Are there attributes of certain economies where a native token is appropriate? That it's a, it, it's a, it's, it will spur as an incentive uh, function. Uh, I'm not willing to give up. I know some of you are minimalist. I'm still thinking of the skins in the, in the 
gamers. Uh, Larry, when you weren't here, we, we, we identified our most avid gamers in the class. Um, and so we always refer to skins, shields, and swords as a form of native token in the gaming sites. Um, but where there might be economics, token economics. So we'll sort of turn to that. On the 15th of November, we've got a couple of guests in uh, Jeff Sprecher and uh, Kelly Loeffler who run uh, the Intercontinental Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange and others, but have real live payments and uh, crypto exchange. We're going to turn, oh, I, I'm sorry, I got it out of order. Primary markets ICOs is, is uh, before and after Thanksgiving, I guess. And then do a little of the back office side. The back office side is clearing and settlement. I mean, the, why is the Australian Stock Exchange using a permission system? Might you use something else? Why is the International Swap and Dealer Association using smart contracts now to try to rationalize a lot of their payment flows? So we'll, we'll get to real live use cases that are happening uh, around smart contracts and permissioned clearing systems. A little bit of trade finance, digital ID. I know at least one group is doing some, uh, uh, one of the groups here is doing something on digital ID. Uh, so you'll be out ahead of us. So that's kind of a review of H2 um, uh, for us. So we had uh, a bunch of readings. Some of them were quite short. I don't know because you were on SIP week whether you, you were able to go through them, but um, you know, maybe I, I'd, uh, just ask, uh, does anybody want to tell me about some of the major trends in payments? I don't know how sleepy everybody is or whether, Priya, I saw your hand or you were, you were scratching your nose. Either way, so I'll go. All right. Um, so digital wallets is a big thing um, now. Um, all the articles acknowledge how, you know, kind of a parallel, Echoing what you see in China, where you have a digital wallet and just pay directly, cutting out all the intermediaries that we currently have. Okay, so one big, 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 big trend. I mean, I've got a bunch of discussion on this, but let's just identify them. Digital wallets or mobile wallets. What other big trend? Like person-person payments, so like Venmo, Apple Pay, <laughs> so, Dash. Like so in Zelle, is that, all right, so person-to-person -person payments, uh, Stephanie? Tokenization, like in Apple Pay, the way you like transform your credit card data into a token. So tokenization, where you can actually transform uh, your identity into a token, in essence, right? Chris? There's a lot of social aspects of payments going on. Like, uh, for, for example, in China, there's WeChat. They have spending millions of dollars in these uh, red envelopes that used to always be cash, and people spend hours uh, during the holiday, the New Year, sending these back and forth um, to each other. So you're calling it so socialization of payments, so to speak. Any others? Just uh, Jack. Uh, biometrics. Biometrics. Absolutely. So it's sort of a, 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 a another trend. So a lot's going on. I'm sorry. So I was going to mention one of the things that caught my eye on the statistics was that the larger so checks, the number of checks is going down but the value is up slightly. So it, it seems to me that the remote payment or digital payment is not capturing the values of payments above $1,000 or $1,500. Right. And I think, I think part of that is because uh, for small values, by and large, few, few of us uh, use checks anymore. In fact, I'll ask, how many in, in this room has written a physical, any written check in the last month? OK. But how many has written a physical chest check for less than $100? All right, some. I can't even remember the last time I wrote a physical check for less than $100. What? Priya. Didn't have a child in school. That's when right. schools do field trips and everything. Well, I, this was not a judgment. <laughs> I wasn't trying to. Uh, oh, Priya, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but, um, but I think we tend to, to write them for larger. Uh, rent checks sometimes, even though I now pay my rent online. Um, yes. Settlement like uh, Ripple and, and Chain. So one more ch change. You said Ripple and who? Chain. Chain. Chaining. Chaining. And are those really live, or you're saying those are things that are going to happen? 
Well, it's, well, it's, well Ripple is live, like, especially in Japan and Korea, which are like into the right. yeah. uh, uh, So then what, what sort of lessons can people draw? We're going to talk a little bit more about M-Pesa and Alipay and so forth. Um, but what, what lessons? Kelly. Something that I took from quite a few of them, and I liked the Global Payments article because it's sort of like, uh, he mentioned the trend in China. It took trends from separate countries and sort of identified their own statistics. You saw in a lot of countries that people don't feel that their payment data or their payment identity is secure on a lot of mobile and digital devices, and that lack of security is preventing them from entering the digital retail right. space. How many people looked at that World Pay article, read your own country, and said, I didn't know that, like there was something? It was just a one pitch per country, so of course it didn't say that much. But um, Alpha? Uh, I don't remember. Was there a page on Ethiopia? It wasn't, unfortunately. No, not yet. Um, but on Mpesa, you know, the big success story in Kenya, um, they've done a tremendous job, and it's built as a huge success of getting mobile payments and wallets sort of distributed. Um, but it's interesting to note that um, they're able to acquire customers by partnering with physical networks of agents. <coughs> and I think that's something that going forward for a lot of these companies, they have to be, you have to be case. You can't be completely decentralized or completely automated. Yeah. That's some physical I mean, network. initially, M-Pesa, which is in Kenya, and you had a reading on it, but it came out of mobile phones and that the value stored on mobile phones for mobile minutes People were trading, in essence. So the, the, um, the uh, network of, of, of users were these uh, shops in Kenya where you could go and uh, get your minutes. Um, kind of going along with that M-Pesa, um, in addition to basically like, you know, easy, I mean, convenience and like lower transaction costs, like M-Pesa, for example, um, we're very instrumental in di um, in corruption cases and like keep letting people know that um, kind of basically cutting the corruption. Right. And right. So there was the example in Afghanistan. Does anybody remember that from the reading? The police officers all of a sudden realized that they got a 30 percent pay increase when the government was paying them directly, but it was actually they didn't get a pay increase. It was like cutting out the middleman or middlewoman of corruption. Uh, I'm going to say gender neutral, but whomever was the, it was probably men, but um, uh, in that case, in, in Afghanistan. Um, and then what challenges are there in the cross-border payment? Well, I've probably got 50% of the class that has personal challenges with cross-border payments, but what, what would be the biggest challenges that you took from the readings or your personal life in cross-border payments? Anyone? I'll say the number of players from you, the, the payment service providers, to the other end, there are just so many layers, which is just an, I incredible how money can move from what seemingly so easy from one country to another. So a lot of layers of intermediation, tons of them. Anything else in the cross-border? Planning and costs. Costs. You've probably had that. Yeah. So let's go through a little bit. So I'm in introducing a guest. There you go. You want to stand up? So Aline, uh, he heads uh, part of the Digital Currency Initiative here at MIT in the Media Lab, all the efforts around uh, Lightning Network and Layer 2 solutions. But before MIT, he was a vice president of First Data. And First Data is a payment system provider. Uh, and he had about 200 people reporting to him. Um, and a big business, uh, $200 million of P&L. That's revenues, right? I mean, if it was profits, even better for you. Uh, and then he spent three years in a startup uh, world. So he's somebody, if you're interested in blockchain and digital currency initiative, you should get to know anyway. But if you're even interested in startups outside of payment world, Aline's great. And he's going to be here today and Thursday. And uh, not only when I make mistakes, but a couple of times I'm going to get you up here to say something about how payments really works. But he's like, way embedded in the MIT blockchain community. So payment systems. Again, what is a payment system? It, it is moving money, of course, but on some level it is a way to amend and record entries on ledgers, because a ledger is how we keep money now. Um, certainly in the digital world, it's always recorded on some ledger somewhere. 
So there's an authorization phase, there's a clearing phase, and then final settlement. Does anybody want to take a crack other than a lien as to what it means to authorize a payment? Just to authorize a payment. It might not have been in the readings, but it's, it's sort of just use, use your uh, language skills to tell me what it might mean to authorize a payment. Tom, your laugh gets you called on. I, I'm struggling to describe it without using the word to authorize. Uh, it reminds me when I was like a freshman in English class at University of Pennsylvania, and I had to describe a telephone without using the word telephone. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, just thinking about like the digital systems we're using right now, it's like when you click send on Venmo, like you authorize the account, the money to leave your ledger. All right, right, so you just use the word authorized to define the word authorized. <laughs> Um, oh, back here. I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. What's that? Dan. Dan. Yeah, I, I just think it's you're you're approving the, the the actual transfer of the money. You're saying it's okay that the right, right. And Dan. I can't. Um, Aviva, good to see you. Um, it has to do also with KYC AMR. Right. And to authorize the source um, of. The, the sender's identity and the source of money, what countries it's coming from, if it's above a certain threshold or a certain amount, financial institutions um, have further checks to do. So, so most, payment, most systems do what Aviva and Dad said. They have to say, we know who the person is. They have uh, the balances in some account. So they are who they say they are, or at least digitally they are, and they have a certain set of balances and monies within an account, and they have the legal uh, ability to move that money, all without using the word authority, um, in essence. Clearing, anybody know what clearing is, or am I gonna have to call on a lien? James. It's in the third party in the middle that confirms that money, it's getting somewhere and it's going somewhere. And it also has to do with netting sometimes. Clearing can be, if, if, if the 100 people in this room were all sending 10,000 movements all in the same day, at the end of the day, you might net all of those movements down so there's fewer actual movements. So historic clearing, which goes back centuries, was also a way to lower the friction, uh, just taking the 100 people in this room, of all those movements. So, Authorization, Aviva. It also has to do with um, foreign exchange. So if someone wants to transact in peso versus dollar, so then you also have to like, net right. off, like you said, that balance. Right, so in, in foreign exchange, any, any, any circumstance, and this is in the securities world as well, you'll hear the words clearing and settling. God knows even when I was chairing the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, all of us sometimes got a little bit you know, confused about the two words, but clearing is pre-settlement. Clearing is netting of transactions, arranging the paper when we were still in a paper world, all in together, taking all the physical checks and getting them all in the same place, in the right place. And then what's settlement? Well, it's, John. it's to discharge. Um, <coughs> to discharge, I like that. Receive the receipt from the phone. To dis dis discharge the receipt. It's basically the, f the final amendment of a record. It's changing a balance from 10 to 11 or 10 to 9. That's settlement. And it's, that's true in securities. Aline. So, to me, this is mesmerizing because there has to be a history behind this authorized clearing and settlement sort of three part movement of money. Because, like, if you think of a computer system, or if you think of a blockchain, if you want, there's no need to do any of this, right? You just do the damn transaction and it's atomic. A moves money to B and you're done. So like, what, how did this even happen? Like, how do we, like to have a computer system that does this is just inane. You don't need any of this in a computer system. So why, why do we still do this in a computer right. system? Like, where did this evolve from? So uh, Aline's question, uh, I was hoping would come out of, of the group. So I'm going to go to the other lean. But there's centuries of history as to why we have these. Uh, but this will lead. Let me stay right here because I think. So first of all, I'm happy that this came up uh, because it's excellent, right? So when I saw the slides, I, you know, I was 
I said, I said this yeah. will be the slides last night. <laughs> so, so I saw that there, there is a really interesting uh, historical component to all of this, as you rightly pointed out, right? Uh, this all came, uh, came from about four decades worth of evolution here, right? So you started with, you know, you, you started with a very uh, convoluted way, as it, as it would appear now, to actually send out paper-based receipts and, you know, like have a plastic-based uh, card, if you will, They'll have to be recorded, and then you, you know, you first of all, need to say, okay, does the person have the money there, right? Is the money there? I'm authorized, right? I'm going to get an answer right back, say, yeah, the money's there. Okay, I just authorized. But it's a very simple, like, ping, right, back and forth, right? So it needs to be a very small transaction. From there on, you, you kind of start to say, okay, now let's let's batch transactions and do the clearing, and then from there on, you actually send on the money, right? The, the the interesting part about all of this is that it evolved in time. Right? So this technology, if you were to do it now, kind of with all of the tools that are at our disposal now, you do it differently, entirely. However, payments, as, as Gary will point out in the next couple of slides, basically evolved organically through decades. And, you know, they started with... So, so stay with us, stay with just so that... That is literally a check that Thomas Jefferson wrote to himself in 1809. But that is a payment instruction from one Thomas Jefferson account to another Thomas Jefferson account. But it's a payment instruction. It didn't actually move the money. It's just a payment instruction. This is a Western Union telegram. The telegraph came along in the 1840s, if I remember. But Western Union took several decades to come along and say, we can send instructions to move value using the telegraph. And the telex machine, which was post-World War II, and yes, I'm old enough to say that there were still telex machines at Goldman Sachs when I started in 1979, that you would type in to type in an instruction. So Aline, you're asking where did it come from? It came from technology move from first authorizing. Does that party have the legal rights to move something, move value. Do they have enough of the value? Is it enough in their account? Uh, and so forth. That's the authorization phase. Now you'd say, well, can't that all be done simultaneously? And the answer is yes, maybe. But most of the payment system is still based on authorization, clearing, and then settlement. Um, Financial ledgers are also the reason. Ledgers record economic activity. We've talked about this uh, earlier in, this, in the semester. They record transactions or accounts. Bitcoin is a transaction ledger. Ethereum and others are account ledgers. But, but they're both ledgers. They're both forms of recording uh, something that has a right. The data is usually used around some right or a token. Um, but the first ledgers were thousands of years ago. And I, I think on those ledgers, I don't know how they split authorization, clearing, and settling, but they were a form of a ledger. Um, I like presidents. I like American history. So I pulled George Washington used to use, use a personal ledger, single entry ledger. But the IBM 360 came along in the early 1960s, and it revolutionized the world of finance and ledgers. It still took about 14 years. I think it was in the early 1970s after a big paperwork crash on Wall Street, meaning literal physical pieces of paper were moving around in the late 1960s, and they had to shut the New York Stock Exchange down, I think, for a day or two because they had gotten weeks or months behind in clearing the paper. They had passed authorization. It was all in clearing securities trends. And it was created by an act of Congress that there would be central clearing and settling. And DTCC was, in essence, created to solve and get out of that huge mess and a problem. But it was on the backs of technology that it could even be done, that there would be a central ledger. Is it helping to answer your question yet? My question kind of changed, so I'll, I'll talk to you after the class. OK. Yeah. Here we go. Did you have a question or more? Yeah. Um, so one thing that came out of the readings for me, uh, I guess it, it's kind of solved by checks, but like, how, is, how are cash transfers captured in all of this? How are cash? Yeah. Cash, cash. Cash, cash. Right, because now that we have digital everything, 
everything is really easy to track. Um, and like we talk about like confidential transactions or private transactions, right? If you give me ten dollars, nobody else in the world knows that you gave me ten dollars. Well, right now this is being recorded. It's being seen, and so you'll give it back to me. But this, no, you can take it. Yeah, yeah. You can take it. Minute, now, right. now, yeah, yeah, remember. What lawsuit was that in? in Scottish lawsuit? Crawford. Um, but that, that bill, what's it say on the top? Federal Reserve note. So it's a Federal Reserve note. It is a Federal Reserve note, which literally means it is a liability of the central bank, the U.S. government. Now, that's a social construct we talked about. It's not that there is a, a room full of gold or a room full of wheat behind it. Uh, there's some gold in Fort Knox. But that is a form of a ledger transaction. It, if you read a little bit more closely, can you see on the upper right there's something in there? United States of America. No, all right. Is there a serial number? Oh, yeah. There is a unique serial number on every Federal Reserve note. That unique serial number is, in essence, tying it to a ledger, a liability of the Federal Reserve. But it's a tokenized ledger receipt. I've handed it to you. It's anonymous. Well, it's not anonymous because it was captured on film. But it was anonymous because it's a tokenized paper. It's actually linen. It's not really paper. Um, uh, it's, uh, the, the, anybody know who is the sole source manufacturer of the linen that goes into Federal Reserve notes? Delaware? Yeah. No. Crane, C-R-A-N-E is the name of the company that has the contract. Um, but it, to answer your question, it's a tokenized form of a specific serialized ledger on the Federal Reserve. So, but that only gets triggered if it goes into and out of institutions, right? If you're, if this bill comes to me and then goes to somebody else and goes to somebody else James, before, yeah, before yeah, it goes into Amanda. a bank, yeah. then none of those transactions are tracked. That's correct. But on something like Venmo they are, or that something like Bitcoin they are too. So yeah. we're moving, there's a big trend that's happening over these last 50 years. We, we had, and if you go back 200 years, it was all anonymous. But once you get into the 20th century, it starts to be more and more digitized. Even early 20th century commerce, big commerce, was starting to be in the banking system. But in the last 50 years, and certainly the last 20 years, uh, we're almost fully digitized in developed countries, not middle economic countries, but that's correct. But this still ties back to a ledger. I'll get that back later. Credit cards. The first big uh, write-up of credit cards was a book from the 1880s that said, what would the world be like in the year 2000? And 15 or 20 times in the book, it used the word credit card. They, they, they fictionalized the future of credit cards. <laughs> I haven't read the book, but I, I just love that it was written in the 1880s. Um, um, but the actual start of the use of credit tokens, if not credit cards, started actually in the late 19th century. And the idea is that you could have a token that was for a particular merchant. And by the 1920s, you had them for uh, uh, getting your gasoline when automobiles started to be popular and so forth. But they were not generalized credit tokens. They were a credit token really by one merchant. So think of them as a merchant-specific token. In the 1940s, in Brooklyn, New York, somebody, in essence, the innovation was to have a more generalized token that could give you credit at more than one merchant. And once that happened, of course, credit cards took off. First in the US, Diner's Card, American Express was in the mid-50s. And then Bank of America figured out, maybe we will even extend credit multiple banks. And they created a network. Bank of America was a California bank. It's not the bank you think of now. In those days, it was California-based. Um, but maybe we could have a network across the whole US. And that network is actually the network that became Visa. It was a shared ownership service amongst a bunch of banks. 
um, across. But the cards had to be processed. Does anybody, uh, does anybody even ever see the processing that's in the left in the middle any longer in the US and Europe? No, you probably. The, the imprinters there is, it still exist. There, there are some cab drivers yeah. who will still take out like uh, one of those, uh, yeah. one yeah. of those machines. So they so, still exist. So they still exist. So technology has moved us in advance. So here we're going to do modern payment systems. I think uh, Aline's going to help me out here. You've got a customer. You, you'll see this play out, but this is what the this is complex system. The customer has an issuing bank. I'm going to say it's me, and I'm Gary Gensler and it's Bank of America. And I might use a credit card to, to instruct my bank. I might use a check. I might use a debit card. I actually have all three, credit card, debit card, and, and checks. I could instruct them in any of those three ways, but there's other ways I can instruct them. I can instruct them and ask Bank of America to send a wire. I can, in the US, ask them to send an automated clearinghouse payment, ACH. Wires are more real-time, ACH take up to two days, is it now? That, that's in the longest form. Okay, so they, 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 the, the ACH has been suffering some pressures and now they actually offer real -time. almost real-time. But traditionally, wires were something that you did which were more immediate and, and, and what's called ACH uh, more slowly. So there's actually five ways I could have my Bank of America send something of value. Um, it has to go through some network. Uh, it's too small to see, but the first little blue arrow there is Visa MasterCard. It might be going across a credit card network. The second arrow there is where this guy used to work. <laughs> first Data, Stripe. There's dozens and dozens of payment processors or payment system processors, PSPs. So you have a credit card, but you might also have somebody called a PSP. Has anybody started a business in this room? A merchant? I'm sure somebody. Has anybody? All right. Did you have to hire a payment system processor? Who'd you hire? First data. First data. When I was chief financial officer of the Hillary campaign, we had to hire a payment system processor with Stripe. So all the donations that were coming in Somebody could use a MasterCard, could use a Visa, could use an American Express. We didn't have any legal contract. We were a merchant. I mean, you might think of it as a political campaign, but we were a merchant. You were a merchant. You hired First Data. So when you start your businesses, whether it's a grocery store, a bar, a political campaign, or something else, you're a merchant. You don't want to deal with a bunch of, of credit card companies. You want one payment system pr processor. And you chose First Data. We chose Stripe um, uh, in that circumstance. Um, so those are the networks. Um, then there, on the other side, there's the merchant bank. Uh, for the Hillary campaign, it was amalgamated bank. Who was your bank? You care? care? I mean, yeah. it, it was in Korea. <laughs> it was in Korea. Yeah. Korea Bank One, let's call it. Yeah. Korea Bank One. Um, uh, so. But the customer is all of a sudden, it's at five layers before it gets to uh, your bank. Uh, and then, of course, you have access and so forth, and you're the customer. So all these steps are in this chain. This is modern payment systems, pretty detailed. Um, digital wallets, we talked about. We're going to say a little bit more about digital wallets. And the big question is whether cryptocurrency is going to have something. But before you get to digital wallets, this is the payment stream. And part of the answer, Aline, to is why you need authorization, clearing, and settlement is there's a lot of steps in this, in the traditional movement of money. And this is just domestic. You, you can add digital wallets, and you can add Bitcoin. And the question is, does cryptocurrency skip all this stuff in the middle? And can digital wallets jumpstart over some of these? And the, and the answer is, digital wallets need to do all these things if they're going to jump. They have to store the value. They have to do some authorization, the equivalent of clearing if there's any clearing, and then move it, which is settlement. Um, so these are the fees. You want to? Can I, can I add a few things? Yeah, I'm please. No, to say, take, to take more. A couple of things, right? <coughs> First of all, you, you'll have to appreciate the fact that this is a system created by banks for banks. 
right? And I think that that, that is, you know, it, it shows, right? This entire value chain, which we're going to go through right afterwards, uh, basically relies on consumer using this process to pay a recipient, right? And it can be a merchant or another consumer, right? Merchants like the fact that they get value. They don't like the fact that they have to pay a lot of money. Right, so that, 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 there's, a, there's an inherent tension there, and that tension manifests itself in a number of ways, uh, but it's important, right? So, that, the, so just the dynamics are such to where uh, this, this black box out here, getting money all the way over here, automatically have, kind of bits away the, the banks for the merchants, right? The, the interesting piece here is that this access method is probably the, the most underrated aspect of this entire value chain. If you think of any time you go to a merchant or to a website or whatever, what, you know, whoever manages that access point, it's probably the most important thing. You may have the best solution out there. If you're not in that access method, that much going to happen. And, and that, I think, is something to import. Because it, as you're going to go through and say, okay, you know, where, is, where does value accumulate in this value chain, what you're going to see is more often than not, access methods are kind of typically the sticking point to actually any meaningful change. Because those are hard changes, right? For, for a large merchant, changing anything in that access point, it's hard. So that, that's something to keep in mind, right? The other thing I would say is one of the things where, you know, where, where we talked about how exactly to get big change at, at scale, right? And you have to have two things. You have to have technology, which is, this is okay, it's not great, right? This is kind of old, it used to be really great about two or three decades ago, but this is not amazing about it anymore. Uh, but this is an unbelievable business model. And if you look at the way the business model operates, consumer love it, consumers love it, right? So consumer, get, you know, I can pay wherever, it's great, right? Banks love it. You know, they make a lot of money out of it. They, they get what's called the internet chain. The banks love it, right? All these other vendors out here, they exist because of it. Merchants, I would say, are kind of neutral to it, right? They, they dislike many aspects of it, but then processing cash is also expensive, right? So if, if you're trying to understand, okay, where do I want to change things here? A lot of folks in the actual payment space will tell you, well, Payments is kind of, you know, it kind of works, right? It really doesn't work if you're, if you're on the fringes. But if you're like in the middle, it kind of works. It's a pretty good system. And, and uh, the, the beauty of the existing model we have right now is actually the business model and the way it works. So I'll pause right there. Because it's, it's not but it's expensive. It's got, it's, a, expensive it's got a lot of friction. Yeah. Um, uh, World Bank statistics say payment systems around the globe take a half a percent to one percent of economies. Now, economies would be much smaller if we didn't have payment systems because we would have never probably come out of the dark ages without some form of payment systems. Um, and in the last 50 years, I think it's been part of, of how economic growth has continued in, in, in the internet phase, you know, how we all uh, uh, transact on the internet. But if you take nothing other than it's complicated and there's a lot of points of friction, then I've done my job. You don't need to know all the uh, individual pieces unless you actually personally want to, you know, like compete with PayPal or Venmo or Zelle uh, or uh, Alipay, um, which is what you might do one day. Never know. Yeah, just a rumor has it. Um, no, the funny thing is, you know, as you'll see, every now and then there comes a player that says, we're going to disrupt payments, and it is one of the hardest products to disrupt. It's a hard place to disrupt. Largely, I think, because of the collective action issues. There's millions of merchants that rely on dozens of payment system providers that, yes, only rely on three to six credit card or debit card companies. In any country, there's usually two to three dominant. It's not always Visa and MasterCard. Of course, not, not in China, for instance. But um, the, the merchant end has such a huge collective action, and that's why Aline focused on the access points. If you're going to disrupt this, you've got to figure out some way to uh, get adoption, broad adoption on the merchant class. Um, the money. This was from the, um, uh, the Bloomberg article, the Bloomberg article that was reviewing China. $2.75 in the U.S. on average comes out of every $100 purchase. <clears throat> and by the way, if you make a $1,000 purchase, it's $27. And, and I used to think when I was on the CFO of the Hillary campaign, if somebody was generous enough to give us $2,700, which was the legal limit to a political ca candidate during that cycle, 
we were paying 70 US dollars to, to, to this, to that, to help elect a president. Or in a billion dollar campaign, 2.7% is $27 million. Now, I'm not saying we spent $27 million on this because we were able to encourage some donors to give us checks. But I will tell you, even being recorded, in the modern economy, it's hard to convince somebody to give you a check. Even somebody who is generously giving their support to a political candidate to win the presidency, and you say, well, we actually get $70 more if you give us a check. <laughs> yeah, but I got my credit card here. Um, so, yes. How would that work if, say, you gave 2770 and so you, the political camp campaign actually ended up with $2,700 in the pocket? Uh, so this is, this, this, this is a legal question for the Federal Election uh, Commission lawyers, but we asked that question. We did ask that question, and it's not allowed. It's not allowed because it's, it's going beyond the legal limit under our federal laws for campaign contributions. That would be deemed to be a $2,770 contribution. Um, even if somehow the donor is paying the $70 directly, we weren't able to solve, by the way, we were not able to solve that because the payment system provider, in our case Stripe or First Data, is actually a vendor for the merchant. And the political campaign, in essence, is the merchant. Are you with me, Sean? Um, well, when you make a, a for instance, a $1 million donation, it's not that you act. A what donation? If you make a million dollars. A million dollars, it's breaking the law right there, but OK. <laughs> I'm being actually, filmed. I just want to make you are not <laughs> You are not actually making a million, because you get a, what, perhaps 1.5% or 2% of the, uh, the points back on your, on your credit system. All right. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> so Sean is just observing that, well, actually, the donor is getting some points back. So this is just averages, and averages sometimes mass things. But $2.20 of the $2.75 actually goes back to the, quote, issuing bank. So if you're doing something on Bank of America, Bank of America might then give you points and share generously. And a lot of the bank programs will share maybe up to half of that. You might get $1 per every $100 or one point for every 100 um, but they're getting $2.20. But you're right. There were some donors that said, well, I'm using my American Express card. I'm getting my points back. And if they gave $1,000, not a million, you know, that they would maybe get the equivalent of $10 of points back. Um, that is correct. So merchants aren't enthusiastic about this split. This is the US model. It does not cost this much in India. It does not cost this much in China. So in many other countries that jump started around the credit card payment systems, it costs a lot less. But in the US, our payment system is significantly built on credit card rails, rails like tracks, um, uh, it's called. So cross-border, I'm not going to go through these two charts. These were, Shimon, I think the US is somewhat unique in the sense that there's bundling of the payment as a service and the credit, right? Right. So the, and those are being unbundled now. But it doesn't have to be the case, and it's not always right. the case, right? So Shimon's point is, is that we in this country have bundled the credit provision with the payment provision. And, and, and there are many of us that when the merchant says, give me your payment data, we give them a credit card, even though we're, we're, we might, in fact, uh, regularly pay off our our credit card on a monthly. I mean, many Americans don't, but many Americans do. So it's this bundling of payment and, and credit services. And you're absolutely right, because when the internet came along in our country, we had established credit card payment rails. And most of the internet payments, whether it was for your mortgage, <coughs> well, usually not mortgage, but whether it was for your utilities, or your uh, small dollar payments were built on top of the credit card rails. Your mortgage, most mortgage lenders would say, no, I don't want to pay uh, the 2.7% uh, uh, um, 
Uh, we didn't have enough market power even as a political campaign to get people to give it to us in checks or to Zell payment to us. Um, but this 2.7 is economic rents. This is a form of economic rents. Uh, fraud, does anybody know the figures for frauds in, in this country? I went, I went and looked at it in the last two days, so it was not in the readings. Total fraud is about 10 to 20 basis points. So of this 270 basis points, or 2.7%, less than 10% of it's really going to pay for fraud. Now, fraud is a really big thing, don't get me wrong, but it's a small portion of, of this. It's not, it's not the dominant feature here. What, what is the credit risk uh, yeah. cost that's covered by that 220? So the, the bank is, there's, there's typically losses on credit cards. <laughs> So, so one thing I would say, I think that point that was just made was, was really useful, right? You do want to just conceptually think about payments, digital payments, and credit as different. They're just different products. Uh, so typically, extending credit to someone, it's a very personal relation, right? I, you know, you cannot really, you, know, you can look at demographics and basically make a guess, right? Uh, the, you know, inherently, there, there's so, some type of payment that are called debit payments, right? When you're using money you already have. Well, that credit risk is much, much smaller than the money that you're not going to pay me back if I give you some money. So the, the, I would say the, the, the big thing that I would, I would encourage everyone is to separate the two and more to the point, okay, what is the, the credit risk? Um, it, it's, I would say it's probably half. I don't know the number and I'll research it, but I would caution to say the credit, the, the compensation for credit doesn't only come out of this. It also comes out of the anywhere from 18 to 27 percent interest rates they're charging. So when you when you think about it, like so, it, it's a it's a dual model. It's it's this, which is not solely for the payment, but I'm saying this is largely for the using the credit card rails as a payment rail, and then you've charged an interest rate spread, which is over a thousand basis points usually. The spread versus underlying bank borrowing is, tends to be anywhere from a thousand to eighteen hundred basis points in some of these. Um, but I'm not. Uh, I'm not saying it's separate. It's two. It's two business models. Let me. Let me ch churn on unless. Uh, you, I'm just got a very brief question. Is that just for credit cards? Or is it for debit cards as well? Are these. So this is for credit cards. Debit cards tended to be about the same, but after the Dodd-Frank Act, the, the regulatory reform bill here in the U.S., uh, and the Durbin Amendment, uh, Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois had an amendment where, where debit cards had to be priced closer to cost plus, a, I can't remember if it said reasonable return on capital, and there was a Federal Reserve rulemaking on that. Uh, debit card numbers came down significantly from this. I just don't know the exact figures. But it's over 100 basis points still on debit cards, but it's not 270. Good question. So I'm not going to go through the details, but cross-border payments have more complexity. <coughs> I'm not going to go through, but the pay this is the, what I'll call the front end. You have a payer on the left and a payee on the right. Think of somebody in the US sending money to somebody in the Philippines, maybe. Um, I need, a, on my side, a payment system pr processor. That's the bubble on the top. I need them to have some payment system processor. They're, they're both ends, on the front end. So just think more complexity, more friction in the system. And really, the reason is, is because you're jumping from one money to another money. Or another way you can think of it is you're usually jumping from one ledger system to another ledger system, if you're thinking like the computers and recording. Um, and uh, the back end, um, I should have called this back end, but I labeled it both of them front end, sorry, um, has a bunch of, of things inside of it. And the one I'm just going to mention is correspondent banking. It, it, it is a feature that came out of centuries of banking. Arguably, you might not need it as much now, but the concept was, I'm a small regional bank in the US. I'm sending something to uh, uh, somebody in the Philippines. 
the Philippines doesn't recognize this small regional bank, let's say in Kansas, I need a correspondent bank that they can trust. So it was a cost of trust that it could go from one country's bank through a, uh, a bank called a correspondent bank, which had trust, to the other country's bank. Or maybe you even had correspondent banks in both countries. But usually you had one international bank in between. Um, Hugo. Hypothetically, if there was, if there became enough trust in the Bitcoin network, could that act as the correspondent bank? Where like you're in the U.S., you go to a Chase or whatever, they transfer your U.S. dollars to Bitcoin. You go over to the Philippines, they transfer your Bitcoin to. There's no need for that. So, so Hugo's asking whether Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency could play that role of a correspondent bank or effectively play the bridge currency between fiat to crypto, US dollar to Bitcoin, you said, and what was the other country? Just to Philippines. Philippines, yeah. uh, which is a peso? Which a, what's that? Peso. Peso, yeah. So US dollar fiat to crypto Bitcoin to Philippine peso. That is called a bridge crypto or bridge currency. That's in fact what Ripple is trying to do with XRP. So Ripple is a company that started as a messaging, a payment messaging service to compete with Swift. <coughs> and that, that messaging service, uh, which we'll talk about more Thursday, has been adopted by many banks. More recently, in 2018, they rolled out a prototype of using a crypto token, XRP, as a bridge currency. I would say yes, that is possible. I think there's an issue also about volatility. So if you're, you're moving fiat dollar to crypto, Bitcoin, XRP, to fiat, if you have a lot of volatility, that, uh, that means it's, it's a less, um, it's, it's, it could be costly. But if it's stable value, so you can, you can lower the cost two ways, lowering the volatility of the crypto or lower the time. And uh, XRP believes they have a solution that can be down to seconds. And thus, even if it's volatility, that in seconds it won't move as much. And the friction will be that you have to sell dollars to buy XRP and then sell XRP to buy peso or, or you can interpose any bridge currency. Uh, one of the most significant opportunities for stable value tokens that we'll talk about in a few classes is maybe is what we can call it is a bridge currency for cross-border. Uh, yes, the question is what will be the fees and if it makes sense from an economic lens. Uh, right. So Western Union and, and other remittance companies can sometimes charge as much as 9 or 10 percent, especially for small dollar uh, remittances. And I don't know if any of you do cross-border remittances, but if it's small dollar, it can be very significant fees. Um, if it's large multi-million dollar transactions, you're getting into corporate treasury functions. So on the blockchain payment solution side, you have to always think about, is this targeted for the retail small dollar transactional side where you're trying to get inside of an 8 to 10% fee structure? But again, if it's only on 50 to $200 US dollar sort of transactions, you, uh, you'd have to figure out how to get your, your cost structure down there. Or is it for the multi-million dollar treasury function? For the Fortune 500 or the, the, the World 1000 or whatever treasury function, where they're really talking about frictions which are in basis points. But still, uh, the bridge currency, crypto bridge currencies might still help in the treasury function side, the, I'll call the corporate treasury function side, all the way to the retail remittance side. Uh, the fee structures, the percentage fees are different. And you just have to be able to say, well, can I get inside of those inefficiencies? And on the retail side, it takes two to five days to do a remittance. So can you get inside the timing? Aline. So, so one of the things that I think I found useful when I was looking at remittances was trying to distinguish between getting remittances from an account to an account, so account to account remittance, versus person to person. And I know they sound the same, but they're not, right? 
A person means, hey, you know what? My, my mother out there doesn't have a bank account. She's a person. Uh, if she were to have an account, then that would be a fairly easy transfer, <coughs> right? But if she doesn't have a bank account, that's not that, that's not that easy, right? Uh, most of the most of the value that all of these Western unions or whatever they bring value by the fact that they have a lot of locations where people can walk in, get their money, get out, right? Uh, a lot of the folks that are coming with solutions right now that are trying to address this account to account problem, as in like, hey, you know what? If you have a bank a, a bank account here and a bank account in uh, in South Korea, it's not not, not that complicated, right? And, and Cryptocurrency can probably actually compete fairly well there. However, if you're trying to say, hey, you know what, I, I, I have a bank account here, but my mother who doesn't have a bank account in South Korea, okay, how do I get the money to her? If I send her cryptocurrency, you're gonna be like, fine, what am I gonna do with this, right? Uh, so the, the real problem that you have to think about if you want to do remittances is, okay, where are the exit ramps on both ends, right? Uh, how exactly are you gonna get that to actually use those funds? And, and also right now, because there's no, economy-wide use of crypto, uh, if you're trying to move value around the globe, uh, on the other end, it's probably fiat to crypto, crypto to fiat. So it's probably two money exchanges. If it's to be stored value, if it's stored value, a lot of people are still willing to store value in crypto. But uh, until it grows larger, it's not a medium of exchange in any uh, economy-wide solution. So. This is a slide you've seen before. We're not going to spend much time. But in payments, some of these matter and some don't. And I think if I did my little thing, some will grow. All right, yeah, there you go. All the illicit activity. Remember in public policy, there's something called the Bank Secrecy Act. If you're thinking about anything in the payment space, you're probably moving something of value. And in almost every country, you have to comply with some form of any money laundering, know your customer, bag secrecy type of thing. Uh, the US Department of Treasury said so in 2013. Um, you probably also have to deal with some consumer protection. That's why that box on the bottom sort of grew. Like you're just not going to lose their money or steal their money. And maybe something about privacy whether it's GDPR type of privacy in Europe or elsewhere. You're not worried about investor protection. But in this country, you have to worry about how to register as a money service provider. And other countries similarly uh, register. Uh, so I just raise that. Um, and as we go through use cases in H2, I'm going to constantly kind of use this chart and say, well, what public policy issues? You don't have to worry about this, the SEC, probably. <laughs> But maybe some stable value token might be an exchange traded fund. So it's possible you might be blurring up against that regulatory state. Uh, so technology is affecting us. And this is a slide I think I've used before with everybody. But I thought, well, wait a minute. What, what of these eight, and there's more technology affecting finance, but what are these main eight are really hitting payments? When I add payments, well, I'd say there's kind of four or five of them. Blockchain is affecting payments. But biometrics, we talked about that earlier. Biometrics, definitely. Mobile telephony. Open API, which is the UK initiative where they're saying that UK banks must allow merchants an ability to get inside of those bank accounts, basically. To, to, it's called Open API, because they have an interface directly into the bank accounts and even uh, the robotic scraping of data, RPA, I think are all related to payments in some way. Or maybe everything, maybe cloud and AI and machine learning. But I kind of think, I think that, that these five are the ones. So blockchain is amongst the things changing payment. It's not the only thing changing payments. Um, and then um, remember a bunch of uh, attempts in the 90s? A bunch of ways to do digital cash in the 90s. We talked about this in the first or section lecture of the course. Fundamentally, why did they all fail? Anybody remember why they failed? They didn't solve the double spend problem. They didn't spend it, solve the double pen spend problem. So Bitcoin and blockchain technology, uh, Nakamoto consensus is a solution to the double spend. Nothing's a 100% solution. It has some challenges, too, but it's a solution to the double spend issue. Um, so then, before Bitcoin, we had a bunch of mobile phone 
uh, mobile payment, and now afterwards. And I just I want to spend our last minutes kind of just chatting about what 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 are the lessons learning. So, first, Alipay and WeChat. Who wants to tell me a little bit? There's probably somebody that. Who has Alipay and WeChat on their phones? Toledo, you want to tell us about it? No. Go ahead. Chris? Yeah, so WeChat was started as just a chat, um, just a chat service. So they built out a huge uh, user base, which is the key for the similarity between uh, WeChat and Alipay. And so essentially, once they had that chat base, they wanted to start monetizing it. And that's where the payment system was added on top. So when WeChat and Alipay started, they started one out of communications, basically chat, text, yeah. right? And Alipay was off of like, uh, is it appropriate, Sean, to call it like China's mixture of, of, of e e eBay and Amazon? Uh, yeah. P2P. P2P. B2B. B B Alibaba is a B2B platform, and uh, Taobao is an e-commerce platform. So has a combination of those. Um, and those payment channels, I don't think it's a surprise. China was not as developed in terms of a credit card rails as the US and had far fewer banked. So these two companies solved a problem that kind of existed because there was not as a developed banking system and credit card systems. Uh, overall, those systems cost less than in the U.S. than 270 basis points. And you, you had an article in the readings that maybe the U.S. payment system is going to get shook up. I, I don't know the answer, but you know, maybe they'll get shaken up by these two. Uh, how about the M-Pesa story? Anybody have M-Pesa on their phones? No? Who wants to give a crack at M-Pesa? It's basically telephone mobile minutes. In all three of these, the central banks saw a, 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 a traditional banking function, payments, and a second traditional banking function, the store of value, being done by non-banks. What do you think the central banks and the official sector did? Uh, they came in and started to regulate those <laughs> Right. Uh, for example, in our reading, they talk about M-Pesa. Actually, the Kenya government oversaw the trust so that even Vodafone like, uh, ran out of the business, people can still use the money stored with the M-Pesa. So let's break it down. So one is the official sector said, whoa, we've got to bring this inside the public policy framework, regulate it. <laughs> And then two, they said in, in, in the Kenya case, it's got to be set up as a trust. And the value, the stored value, has to be in the banking system, literally. So all, the, all those little, uh, Eric? Yeah, I just wanted to add one example to your list that actually is the opposite of what just been described. This Modelo Peru, which is Peru model. And it's the initiative Peru that was Peru model. Peru model. Yeah, and it was it was tackled or um, be begun by a former production minister in Peru, who actually thought about that that potential issue, and she started uh, reaching out to the to all local banks and all local telcos, brought them all together. And, and created a, a whole um, a model that's called Billetera Mobile, which is a mobile wallet in Spanish. And it, it's been growing since 2016 as a means, to, uh, as a, as a means of uh, financial inclusion for underserved populations and, and, and people that, are, that don't have bank accounts. Because banks see that as an opportunity to get more customers. So, Eric, can I ask you a couple questions? Do you know, was it? a means for just payment, or did they actually store value in this system? It's both. Oh. It's, yeah, it's, you can use your mobile to pay to, an, to another person, to a merchant, for example, right. small store uh, uh, with another mobile, or you can actually cash it out to a, a 
So has, has it been brought inside? Is it now being regulated as a financial firm? It's begun regulated and it began with the, with the oh, it it's now a spin off as a, as a, what we call Sociedad Anonima, which is some sort of uh, private company. Right. But it's basically a, consor a consortium of all the banks yeah. in Peru. So uh, if, you, if, if you can send me an email with its name, I'd love that. And maybe I'll put something on Canvas about it. But in all these circumstances, they were payments, but they also had, um, they started storing value. The other one I want to mention is Starbucks. Starbucks, how many people have Starbucks on their phone? And they have, right? So, uh, wait a minute, wait, who, I saw a hand back there. Larry, geez, I'm gonna call on you then. Who knows? Who knows? All right, does it store value? <coughs> yeah, it steals value. Like you have a minimum <laughs> amount of deposit. So $20, for example. And whenever it goes below the minimum, it kicks another 20 in. So you never, so they basically taken $20 and held it permanently. It's so, free. so they're taking it out of your bank account. Right? You gave them authorization, back to that word authorization, to just take money out of your bank account. So <clears throat> this is a form of what used to be when Larry and I were kids. You, you could have physical prepaid cards, gift cards. I got them on my birthday. <laughs> you know, It's a gift card. But now it's sort of prepaid cards on your mobile phone. I think if... Starbucks had billions of dollars in everybody's $20 that the US Federal Reserve might top knock on their door and say, you've got to register as a bank or you've got to. In China, basically, that's what happened to uh, Alibaba. The largest money market fund in the whole world is at Ant Financial Alipay, largest, about 300 billion US dollars. But I think the same would happen with Starbucks uh, because they're storing value. And in, in Kenya, they said, you've got to put it in a trust. And by the way, we, we want you to make deposits with 100% of this in the banking system. And th that official sector said, we don't want to disintermediate the commercial banks. Now, they didn't write that in a statement. They probably couched it all in consumer protection. But it, the essence, the outcome was, they were keeping their commercial banking system alive uh, by doing it. Starbucks, I don't know what they're doing, Larry, with your $20. But I, well, you don't either. No, but I don't think it's a surprise that Starbucks is partnered with uh, Intercontinental Exchange. Uh, uh, and you should ask you know, Jeff and Kelly when they're with us, well, why is that connection? I'm sorry, there were a couple hands. I saw Jihee and I saw Ali. I just wanted to point out that it's, you, you probably have set, um, set the auto subscriber order. Uh, okay. Oh, no, you can tell Larry advice. How did he set his auto subscriber? No, that's right. I mean, I could like physically have to go through every time I want to reload, but obviously right. that's just a waste of my time. So, <laughs> like, the interest that I'm losing is probably worth my time, you know, so I'm not complaining in that sense, but it is amazing. It must be an extraordinary amount of money. So. Yeah. I'm not, they're doing you a service. I'm not saying they're not doing you a service. Let me take one more Priya, and then I'm going to go to two more. Interesting backstory to the Empresa Safaricom piece. So I used to work for one of the NGOs that pioneered the village savings and loans concept in all of Africa. Right. And what happened in Kenya was that you had these groups, like hundreds of thousands of them, in very remote places. And these groups, you know, they had annual saving cycles and eventually, you know, they were saving very little money, but they were saving. And they didn't have the w a way to then um, uh, move into the formal economy, you know, so the money just stayed there and it literally was money stored in a box with three locks and there were very, and it, you know, it was a way that even without literacy to do it. At that time, DFID, the British uh, Overseas Development Agency, was sponsoring a few of these NGOs to do this work. And the consortium's biggest problem was, now how do we, the next step up is to transition them into the formal economy and gain access to credit. It was like the opposite approach of the micro movements. And that's the point when in Kenya this breakthrough happened, is when these savings groups finally had some money and the first thing that happened in their villages, like no bank was going to open a branch, 
there was a movement around mobile bench branches, but even that was very expensive for the amount of money that each of these groups was saving. And so that then these first operators came up, it was almost like an act of frustration, you know, like, okay, we have this cash in this box that cannot be stored, so now we're just gonna move. So, so let me do the capture. So some of the themes is that where there's a market gap, there's a gap in Kenya with unbanked. And by the way, half of sub-Saharan Africa is still unbanked, but half of that unbanked have mobile phones. So, but there is a gap in China, and so Ali, Pay, and WeChat, and so forth started to fill it. What gaps are there today that you all can fill? And then secondly, does a blockchain technology solution help fill that gap? There might be big gaps created by 275 basis points in the US, the two and three quarters percent in, in using the credit card rails for payments. There might be gaps of the unbanked. There might be a big gaps in customer user interface, because a lot of the customer user interface in current banking isn't that great as we move to mobile phones, QR codes. Um, uh, 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 there, there was a nice uh, comment. See, if you do comment, I remember what you say online. But it, uh, there was a nice comment about QR codes. Where are QR codes used in payment most dominantly? Two countries, what? China and India. The US, and I would even contend Europe, are no longer at the forefront of payments because we've sort of had existing big legacy systems. But that might mean that those big legacy systems built on the credit card rails dominantly might be vulnerable. A quick thing just on um, the methods. This was out of a report you had, but I just thought in 2016, 29% still credit card. Estimate five years from now, worldwide down to 15%. E-wallets, 18% to 46%. Those trends, if they're right, and of course they won't be exactly right, but those trends creates opportunity. When you have huge changes and people are changing the way they're doing things, that's usually where business opportunities are. You, you had, um, uh, th this is too detailed, but I think it's sort of fascinating that the, the, the Federal Reserve puts this out once a year. It's always old, stale data. But the big things I took away is that we've got a huge change that's happening here, even in the US. Um, and, and card payments um, still growing, of course, but not like they once were. Mobile payments are big changing. Half of all card payments are done online, by the way, not in person now. Um, so those statistics, if you're going to build a real business and not just a business for a final project for you know, Gensler's course, uh, you're going to want to dive into these statistics. You want to want to see where are the opportunities, what are the trends uh, in the statistics. Um, and then Bitcoin came along. And we're not going to chat more, but uh, I'm going to just say, just as the two minutes left, don't forget the economics. And I say this again, coming back to having read 50 papers over the weekend. <laughs> when you're writing for the rest of the semester, whatever, whatever, whatever section, whether you write on payments, whether you write on central bank, whatever you write on, remember about thinking about what are the benefits of blockchain? What are the real specifics? And particularly, how does it lower verification or networking costs? like Christian Catalini wrote about, but just we talked about, come into my office, ask for office hours, say, wait a minute, how does this, does it really need to happen this way? And most importantly, what are the net benefits? And I keep coming to my friend Brodish, no, don't do a traditional database. You gotta get to a private blockchain. <laughs> This is not a traditional database course. We're, we're about permission blockchain or permissionless blockchain. And remember, blockchains are about append-only logs with some consensus, with multiple parties having the right to change the state of the ledger. So it's sort of like, when is that valuable? I believe there is value to that, but not in every circumstance. 
And certainly if there's a native token, why do you need a native token? Is it there to jumpstart a network? Is it to help with token economics? Remembering that there's great network effects to having one currency per jurisdiction. But let not forget that certain multi-jurisdiction currencies have failed. The history of multi-jurisdiction currencies is they almost always fail. We, we still have not seen the end or, or what's going to happen with the euro. I mean, decades from now, I'm saying. And don't forget the skins and the swords as well. So we're back together again on Thursday. We're going to do payments on that day. We're going to dive more into payments, actual blockchain technology stuff and payments. Thank you, Aline.